Hey everybody, Uncle Rich here for Who's Telling the Truth. <clears throat> Today is March 16th, uh, 2015, and today's show is named Merchants of Doubt. And the reason why we named it Merchants of Doubt is in honor of the movie that just came out from uh, Naomi uh, or or Eskis. That's a tough last name, guys, but it's going to become a household word because when you watch this movie, and all I have today is the trailers and some, uh, you know, clips that are part of the movie. Um, but guys, today we're going to get a, a real look at exactly how the American public is being hustled. And guys, uh, you know, last week we did a uh, show called Deniers and liars, and we exposed Mark Morano and uh, Dr. Willie Hoksoon, and we showed the lies and the deceit, and guys, today, it, we're just gonna keep piling it on, and why? Because the movie was just released. And the movie just started playing in the theater, and matter of fact, it's on a, a selected schedule where it's only been playing like in Boston and somewhere on uh, Ottawa, I think. But anyway, eventually it'll come around. But tonight we want to introduce it to you. And because today is St. Patrick's Day, you know, we've surrounded ourselves with some uh, shamrocks and everything in honor of St. Patrick's. And guys, today's show is primarily going to be the Merchants of Doubt. But... You know, we're going to be talking about, uh, we want to talk about Fox News, and uh, there's some stuff that's been happening, but the, like I said, the lion's share of the show is going to go uh, towards the merchants of doubt. But guys, at, this, at the start of this show, I've got some good news and some bad news. First, the good news. Look at that. Guys, for the first time in 40 years, the world economy grew, but CO2 emissions didn't. That's right, 2014 was a very good year for sustainable uh, energy. Guys, we're, we're, starting, we're starting to move the needle. We're starting to move the needle. Now, that's the good news. Now for the bad news. A new poll conducted by Suffolk University in Boston, Fox News is by far the most trusted national TV news source in America. Judy, I'm not sure if everybody heard that. So could you, could you play that, poll that clip by again? Suffolk University in Boston, Fox News is by far the most trusted national TV news source in America. Okay, once again, we're having a little bit of a problem with the audio out here, and I hope I don't have to go crazy with this again. But guys, you heard what O'Reilly said. He said Fox News is the most trusted name in national TV news. Now, Judy, let, let's play that clip once more because what read what it University? says there. Read on the right-hand side the talking points and listen. He's saying two different things, but Judy, play it once more. According to a new poll conducted by Suffolk University in Boston, Fox News is by far the most trusted national TV news source in America. See, the graphic on the TV said political audience, and O'Reilly's calling it a national audience. Now, guys, we all know that Uncle Joey is probably going to be dancing He's going to be dancing his little uh, T-Billy uh, T -Billy jig up with his other buddies because he's going to think it's so important that Fox News is the most trusted name in, in, in uh, Fox News is the most trusted name in news. Now, guys, we're going we're gonna to go back to the uh, first, uh, not to the first clip, but I want to read from the sustainable energy, and then we want to pick up on the uh, on Bill O'Reilly. So Judy, let's play the let's show the first the second still now, and I there we go, guys. Uh, like I said earlier, two fourteen was a very good year for sustainable energy. A new report 
has revealed that while the global economy continued to grow throughout 2014, our collective carbon emissions stalled, something we haven't managed to do in the past 40 years. And the group behind the report, the International Agency, Energy Agency, the IEA, are putting it down to the serious uptake of renewable energy facilities by governments around the world. While the actual amount of carbon we emitted is pretty sobering, 32.3 billion tons, it's unchanged from what we dished out in 2013, while the global economy saw a growth of 3%. The report shows three times in the past 40 years where the carbon emissions remain unchanged from the previous year, once in the early 80s, 92 and 2009, but that time the event was coupled with was not coupled with economic growth. Judy, if we can go to the next clip now. We'll go to the next still. I'm sorry, the next still. There you go. And guys, uh, like you can read, solar and wind and other renewables are making such a big difference in greenhouse gas emissions worldwide that global emissions from the energy sector flatline during a time of economic growth for the first time in 40 years. Guys, all right, Judy, you can come back to me now. Guys, it's working. We're starting to make a difference. And how are we making the difference? It's all from this show. I'll give Joey the business. Joey, you can thank me, buddy. No, but guys, really, it's all about <clears throat> the social agenda and being able to talk to people socially. And guys, I've been doing a lot of stuff on Facebook, and tonight on Facebook we're gonna do, uh, tonight on one of the clips we're gonna do uh, is from Susan Haig. I wanna give Susan a shout out. She sent me the video with um, Ted Cruz, which you're gonna love, and if it wasn't for her, I would've never known the video existed. And also, uh, Gregory Heathen, he sent in another clip, and I tell you, oh, that, he sent in the clip with the windmills. So if it wasn't, but you see how socially we're interacting, and we're starting to tell each other things that are going on, and this is the whole idea. And that's why I want to promote the movie uh, Merchants of Doubt. Now, getting back to Bill O'Reilly and getting back to the fact that Fox seems to be the most trusted name in news, we're gonna show you how the deception with Fox News and the misrepresentations don't stop. I mean, they just, they can't lie straight, but they do an awful good, at try, an awful good job at trying. So Judy, we're gonna have, we're gonna play clip number four with Chris Hayes now. So hit it. It's paying off. According to a new poll conducted by Suffolk University in Boston, Fox News is by far the most trusted national TV news source in America. It's working, America. Over the past few years, the claim has popped up a number of times, including perhaps on your Facebook page, that Fox News is America's most trusted national news network. This week, we got a new poll from Quinnipiac University with the same conclusion. As reported by the Washington Post, Fox News is the most trusted national news channel, and it's not that close. Depending on where you stand politically, that news either gets you excited or perhaps depressed beyond all measure. But here's the thing, and listen very closely. There is a reason Fox News keeps being ranked as the most trusted news source in these polls, and it is connected to the reason that Fox is as profitable and as highly rated as it is, which in turn is tied to both the media landscape and the way liberals and conservatives consume media. And everyone gets this wrong, including people that write about media for a living. So let me just give you this analogy. Imagine a presidential race that was just an open race where you could vote for anyone, and there are six candidates. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, John Kerry, Al Gore, and Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee would win that race. And maybe that would lead you to think, Mike Huckabee is the most popular politician in America, which is not true. But in this mock race, there's only one candidate to represent all of the conservatives in this country and five candidates who would split the vote of everyone else. And that is exactly the way the media landscape looks in this country right now. You have one national TV news outlet that conservatives watch, Fox News, and a whole bunch of news outlets that everyone else watches. 
Look at that new poll. While Fox News took the title most trusted, only 29% of voters chose the network. Another 57% of voters were split between MSNBC, CNN, NBC, ABC, and CBS News. And here's the thing. According to data from the Pew Center, audiences for basically every outlet in both the so-called mainstream media and progressive media, from HuffPo to The New Yorker to Nightly News to The Economist and Slate and USA Today, all of them, they all skew left to center. That is not an accident. Because conservative media outlets, like Fox News, spend day after day discouraging their viewers from watching other outlets, telling them they are being lied to, telling them they are being sneered at and laughed at and spit upon by the mainstream media. With an assist from conservative websites and talk radio, Fox News has successfully managed to convince a huge portion of the country that no other network, hardly any other outlets, can be trusted. And the network tells that story over and over again because, as Rupert Mur Murdoch and Robert Roger Ailes know, it's very good for business. <clears throat> Guys, did you hear what, what he said? Fox News is a business. They're, they're selling a product. And Joe doesn't seem to understand this. Now, when somebody tells you, Fox News is the most trusted name in, in news by a wide margin, by, by, a, 20, by a 29, they got 29% of the uh, audience. What does that tell you? That 71% don't trust Fox News. So you'll have guys like Joey jumping around going, hey, you know, we're the most popular. You're not. You're not the most popular thing because there's, there's other things that are the mainstream media. <laughs> so isn't it funny that Fox News takes the other side that everybody else takes? Joey, wake up, kid. But Joey doesn't care because he's part of a cult. And I explained, and he said, Rich, what kind of a cult do you think I'm in? You're in the conservative cult, Joe. And why? Because you watch a news program that has an agenda to it. It's a business. And when you want to, uh, uh, in, in order to be a successful business, what's the one thing you have to do? You have to practice your trade. And most importantly, you have to go to school. You need a good education. I mean, if you're going to be a climate denier, you got to get all your ducks in a row. So where do you go to get all your ducks in a row? You go to denial school. And where is denial school held? <laughs> denial school is held by the Heartland Institute. Who funds the Heartland Institute? Who funds the Heartland Institute? Joey, come on. Your buddies, the Koch brothers, you know it. These are the guys that want to buy the country and make everybody crazy. And that, th those are the guys that are responsible for pushing me out the door and getting me in front of the camera because I can't take it anymore because of the deceit and the dishonesty. So on the next clip, we're going to show you what denial school looks like. So Judy, hit it. In an effort to better understand why this is still a debate in our country, even in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, we attended a very different type of environmental conference. This is how we win the debate. We have these folks, these eggheads that sit there that think that they never have to defend themselves, but we in the skeptical community, we have to. And that's where the science is being refined, is being proven, and that's where we're winning. So we're here at the ninth International Conference on Climate Change. These are the climate change deniers. I mean, if you see some of the sponsors here, the Ayn Rand Institute, the International Climate Coalition, are right next to the Illinois Coal Association. The real question is, how do we bring centrists and the left over to climate realism? Now, this particular conference happened to be organized by the Heartland Institute whose donors over the years have included such odd bedfellows to an environmental organization as one of the largest oil companies in the world, ExxonMobil, and the Charles Koch Foundation. Heartland President Joe Bast is no stranger to controversy. His foundation spent much of the 90s refuting the dangers of smoking for tobacco companies. And now those same tactics are being employed 
to refute the science of climate change. So what do you do here at the Conference for Climate Change? Our focus is questioning the claim that there's a consensus that climate is both man-made and dangerous. We don't see the data that backs up the public claims that global warming is a crisis. So there's an agreement that global warming is happening, just not that it's a crisis? Yeah, there can be an impact on uh, climate by the human presence, but it's probably very small. So the stance of, of many people in this conference or even foundation is, let's wait and see, because we don't know the science. I would, I would say that's correct, right. yeah. Now, since these types of groups can no longer credibly deny that climate change is actually happening, they are meeting here to refine their message. So I think this is a perfect example of the talking points on global warming. It's not man-made, it's a natural variation warmer is better, human impact is small, and there's no consensus, which is exactly what they keep telling us. It's like a, a script. Everybody's saying the exact same thing. Observations are contingent, okay? They're probable. They are certainly not knowledge. They're not universal, necessary, and certain. Environmental groups, they have lots of money in which to get their message across. And of course, their message is basically selling fear. So they talk about big oil. That's nothing compared to big green. Now it's conferences like these, where the script to deny climate change is actually written. And once that script is written and agreed upon, it's political pundits like Mark Morano that have time-tested and effective methods of staying on message and getting this script out to the rest of the country. There are quite literally hundreds of factors that influence global temperature. Everything There's from quite literally hundreds of factors that influence global temperature. Quite literally hundreds of factors that influence global temperature. The idea that CO2 is the tail that wags the dogs is not supportable. And true to form at this conference, he stuck word for word to the script. Quite simply, there are literally hundreds of factors that influence our climate. CO2 is not the tail that wags the dog. It is not the climate control knob. We envision rising temperatures, prolonged droughts, freakish storms, hellish wildfires, rising sea levels, food rights, mass starvation, conflicts of every sort up to and including fuel, full-scale war, and we're forced millions of people to abandon their traditional lands and flee to the squalor of shanty towns. That, in a nutshell, is how wacky the global warming debate goes. What I do as a blogger is then sent out to radio producers, radio hosts, everyone from Mark Levin to Rush Limbaugh on down. Suddenly, it's on the Drudge Report. Suddenly, Fox News is reporting it. Suddenly, Sean Hannity's talking about it. Suddenly, it's in the Washington Times, the Washington Examiner. Suddenly, it's in papers all across the country. Then, it goes on Capitol Hill as well. So then, you got Capitol Hill staffers get it, speech writers for senators and congressmen. Now, in response to the latest scientific consensus, the new script that has been written to keep this debate going centers around Antarctica. We've got a new report, and it's from NASA, and it says Antarctic ice, it's melting, and that melting process seems to be irreversible. Hmm. Now, you say NASA's wrong, but you're not a scientist, are you? You don't, you're not going to make any claims like that. The interesting thing is the southern hemisphere, Antarctica as a whole, sea ice is well above average, breaking all sorts of records. Antarctic sea ice, which has hit the record all time ever recorded since satellite monitoring began. Global sea ice is at record ice extent since satellite monitoring began in 1979. So take a step back and look at the big picture. So that's exactly what we did. In order to see if their latest talking point is true, we took a step back to get the bigger picture of what exactly is happening in Antarctica. So we headed down to the bottom of South America to meet up with renowned glaciologist, Dr. Eric Rigno. Judy, that's it. There we go. Okay, so guys, we wouldn't leave you hanging. You know, in a show like this, what's the one thing we're gonna do? We're going to tell you the truth. But you're going to have to wait so that we can show you how they're spinning the global uh, warming, especially in, 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 in Antarctica. But guys, the next clip is going to be the actual trailer for the uh, movie The Merchants of Doubt. And you'll get a good taste for what the movie's like. And then um, uh, we'll talk about it on the backside. So Judy? Roll the trailer. Communication is about sales. Keep it simple. People will fill in the blank with their own, I hate to say biases, but with their own perspective in many cases. The tobacco companies knew nicotine was an addictive drug, yet they told Congress. I believe nicotine is not addictive. 
the same small group of people that the tobacco industry used, working on all kinds of other issues. Dioxins, pesticides, chemicals in general, I mean, there's no evidence that these are harming us. Scientists would explain the science. Against the scientists, they will have a so-called expert. Seven-week-old baby was in a crib. I literally heard a gasp when he told the story about this baby. Either one of you paid to testify for your time here in opposition to the bill. Citizens for fire safety. Citizens for fire safety, the three largest makers of flame retardants in the world. These so-called experts turn out to be very, very good at it. I'm not a scientist, although I do play one on TV occasionally. Uh, okay, hell, more than occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> it creates a whole new cast of characters, these people who become well-known for casting doubt on global warming. Catastrophic global warming is a hoax. There's no scientific consensus. You go up against a scientist, most of them are very hard to understand and very boring. It's all about preventing you from looking where the action really is, which is in the science. The Earth is getting warmer, no question about it. Old face, no It's kind of an amazing accomplishment. Such a small group of people have had an enormous impact on public opinion. We're the negative force. We're just trying to stop stuff. You won't fool me anymore. Guys, that movie's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I love it when we catch these guys with their hand in the cookie jar. I mean, boy, this, there, if there's one thing I enjoy in life, it's being right. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, go, I mean, they drive me nuts, and this is the reason why I'm here. You know, they'll do whatever, what, whatever it takes to sell their product. These guys don't have that little guy on their shoulder. You know, the guy that says, hey, hey, what are you doing? What about the rest of humanity? Why are you lying? They don't have that guy. They, they booted him off. They got rid of him. Why? Because they're a, they, they watch Fox News. And what's the people that work for Fox News? They're fox -titutes. They sold out. They don't care. They're in it for one thing and one thing only. And it ain't, it's money, it ain't sex. And why would you sell out like that? Now the cl next clip we're gonna show you is from a guy, he's being interviewed by Tom Hartman, and his name is Kurt Davies. And he's gonna recommend, he's gonna give us a, a couple of uh, minutes and recommend the movie Merchants of Doubt. So Judy, Hit it. Your yeah. viewers, by the way, there's a fantastic film coming out in about a week called Merchants of Doubt that is the best illustration of this. It's based on Naomi Oreskes' book by the same title and done by Robbie Kenner, the guy who did Food, Inc. And it, it shows how the tobacco tactics of spreading misinformation, creating false experts, uh, PR campaigns, have translated to chemicals, pesticides, flame retardants, and now on climate. They do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful film. So it's coming out in New York and L.A. next Friday and then nationwide the week after that. This is the film that was uh, just uh, previewed at Sundance uh, Probably, probably yeah, a few weeks ago. That's right. Because that's right. I've had several people uh, you know, send me notes or whatever, you know, going, Check it saying out. what you said. You Your know? viewers oh, will love it. It's, it's a really good, it's a, and this is an illustration of in real time, yeah. we still have the same problem. What is the uh, fate of Willie Soon, and how many more Willie Soons are out there? Uh, we don't know. Really, so, so now the, the Smithsonian has opened an inspector general uh, investigation of this. They're looking into it. Um, they were taking part of the money, so they're implicated. Uh, they were they were had overhead uh, associated with these grants. So. Is it, hopefully that investigation um, will discover what else was going on there and the, and the real uh, you know the real setup, but you know I don't know what will happen to him. I don't want to judge yet. I'm not a judge, um, and, and we don't yet know how many Willie Soons there are. Well, there are, there are a lot. He he has a, a large cohort, but he was a star because he had that Harvard Smithsonian nameplate that Exxon and the Koch brothers sure did covet. Kurt Davies, great to Thank see you. you. Indeed. Thanks so much for being here. Guys, did you hear what Kurt said? He said, how many Willie Soons are out there? And how many people are willing to sell their soul? How many people are willing to look at a chart like this 
And the source for this chart is NASA and NOAA. And you look at a chart like this, and this is as plain as the nose on my face. But you get guys like Joey and Marty, they look at this chart, and what do they say? They deny it. They can't believe it. And why? Because they're part of a tribe. And if they don't stick with the tribal beliefs, they get kicked out of the tribe. And if you belong to the conservative tribe, guess what rule number one is? You're not allowed to read thermometers. Because if you were able to read a thermometer, you'd be able to understand what was going on. And you're also not allowed to be able to look at how much carbon we're putting in the air. Guys, when you look at this, wrong side of the when you look, I mean, that's scary. When you say something's off the chart, it doesn't get any more off the chart than that is. That's off the off chart. And you know, this is what Al Gore did in his movie when he used a scissor, you know, scissor jack to show how high carbon is. But we showed on the show tonight that carbon stalled, so we're moving in the right direction. But the next clip we're gonna show you guys is from one of my favorites, Bill Maher. And he's gonna, um, he's gonna um, interview director Robert Kenner. And I think you'll love this interview. So Judy, hit it. First up, he is the award-winning director of Food, Inc., whose latest documentary, Merchants of Doubt, opens March 6th. Please welcome Robert Kenner. <laughs> Hello, sir. Thanks a lot. Great pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. I really enjoyed your, uh, your documentary. You know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, and usually when people take disparate elements in society and put them together, I say, oh, that's conspiracy theory stuff. But, but this is what you do, and it's not a conspiracy theory. Merchants of Doubt, it's about, there are people in this country who absolutely are in the business of deceiving the public, and they'll do it to any, for anybody. They'll do it for big oil, big pharma, they'll do it big tobacco, big pesticides, is that right? It's absolutely right. They've developed a skill. It started uh, with tobacco. Uh, for 50 years, they were able to, you know, create doubt around a product where we knew uh, this product caused cancer, it was addictive, and they were able to uh, keep questions alive as to whether this was true. And actually today, they have to take out ads saying they lied. Uh, and thank God that they have to. Uh, but it took a long time for that to happen. And that was the first one, to that, That's yeah, where they I really mean, got their bones in this. They were really good at it. And those same people went on to work for multiple products. Uh, a guy named Peter Sparber, who's in our film, right. went from tobacco uh, well, working for tobacco, he went and uh, convinced firemen uh, that it wasn't cigarettes that caused house fires, it was couches. Uh, and he was, able, he was able to make it a law that we have to put chemicals in our couches that prevent fires, uh, when the chemicals neither prevented the fires, and at the same time, they also caused cancer. And that became a law, and that, that takes a very talented person to be able to do that. He had said, if you can sell tobacco, you can sell anything, and went on to work for multiple uh, industries, as did this whole group of people. Uh, and, and the methods they used, like I, I noticed it's similar in each of these industries. They will, they will use that, that line that works so well on the American public that uh, if we, if we protect you, it's going to infringe on your freedoms. Yeah. It worked with tobacco, right? That's your freedom. Work with food, sodas and yeah. stuff, and uh, global warming. It's going to hurt the economy. Yeah, these people went on from tobacco to pharmaceutical into global warming, which is the next big payday. Uh, Richard Berman was recorded at a conference in Colorado saying, you know, you can either uh, lose pretty or win ugly, and I can help you win. Uh, right. And these guys are ready to do whatever it takes to go uh, sell their product. Guys, it's the old freedom routine. And you know, Joey talks about it. You're, you're impeding on my freedom. I wanna have the freedom to be able to do whatever I wanna do, whenever I wanna do it, and I don't want government regulations in my way. Joe, remember when we used to be able to smoke on airplanes? Do you remember how ridiculous, how we used to smoke in restaurants? 
I mean, I can remember one time lighting up a cigarette and a guy yelling at me and I was going to tell him to go shove it. Now I wouldn't think twice about smoking in a, in a public building. I see people smoking on, on, uh, in old um, uh, TV shows and in old movies. And I go, man, look at, I mean, what we used to accept. And we have to change the culture. And that's why, hopefully, socially, we'll be able to do this. And guys, the next clip is going to be primarily on Naomi or Eskis. That's a tough last name. But we're going to keep going with the same theme. And when you see what these guys do and the agenda that they have, <clears throat> and what really bothers me is these scientists have been threatened. And on the last show, if you remember on the last show, we showed Mark Morano, and the girl that was interviewing him, he put up the scientist's name on his website. You know, in order to just to inflame people, not to inform them, to inflame them. And you, can, you, know, you push some of these people over the edge, they ain't wrapped too tight. You know, you can't do stuff like this. But the next clip is going to be from Naomi. She's the one that wrote the book and, and obviously has a lot to do with the movie. And you're going to see what kind of threats they have and exactly how the conservatives handle this BS. So Judy, hit it. Starting in the 50s with the, uh, the wave of public concern about smoking causing cancer, the tobacco companies developed a very sophisticated, probably the most sophisticated effort to confuse the public about science, to confuse scientists about science. And now we've seen the, 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 a lot of the same people, in fact, have gone over to becoming climate deniers using exactly the same kinds of strategies. I didn't think that we'd have a chance of getting, you know, anyone to go to the theater to go see a film about climate change because Al Gore has already made a film about climate change. If you look at the 10 hottest years ever measured, they've all occurred in the last 14 years. And the hottest of all was 2005. And the one thing we've learned is when you explain science to people, it hardens those who don't believe in the science. So it became a film about doubters and how people are able to stop us from believing in convenient science. In March 2015, director Robert Kenner will attempt what no one else has successfully done since An Inconvenient Truth, debut a successful documentary about climate change. The tobacco companies knew nicotine was an addictive drug, yet they told Congress, I believe nicotine is not addictive. See the same small group of people that the tobacco industry used working on all kinds of other issues. Dioxins, pesticides, chemicals in general, I mean, there's no evidence that these are harming us. And tobacco is a great metaphor uh, because we know those are lies. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And the, you know, and when we start to see a lot of those people are the same people, and a lot of the arguments are the same arguments, it makes it a little easier to say, hey, maybe we're being lied to about other things, uh, including energy. The movie Merchants of Doubt is based on the book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. A key part of the strategy from the very beginning is to undermine the idea of scientific consensus. And one of the things they discovered in their own market research was that if you can persuade people that there's no scientific consensus, then people will think that it would be premature to act. So it's a very, very powerful strategy that we know works. And this is why you hear them saying as a kind of mantra, there's no consensus, the science isn't settled, you know, we have experts who don't agree, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty, there's considerable uncertainty, you know, you hear this phrase, considerable uncertainty, repeated over and over again. Science historian Naomi Oreskes authored a high-profile paper detailing the overwhelming scientific consensus on human-caused climate change. 
So the paper essentially just says that if you look at what scientific experts have to say on the subject of whether or not climate change is underway and whether it's mostly caused by human activities, the scientific community is clear the answer to that question is yes. And so the paper was simply just saying that. That's it. That was the whole thing. Nothing more. Yes, this is what scientists have to say. What was the response to the paper after it came out? Uh, well, that's when I started getting attacked. And that was when life sort of changed. It was a bit like, you know, going through the looking glass. And one of my colleagues at Scripps, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, said to me, you should talk to Ben Santer. Something sort of similar happened to him. Ben Santer, a senior atmospheric scientist at Livermore National Labs, was a key author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report in 1995. It was Santer who crafted the carefully worded key passage in the document, announcing for the first time that the balance of scientific evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. So my life changed. Um, lots of people didn't like that balance of evidence statement, and no personal animus, but I was, I was the carrier of that message. So you take down the message by taking down the messenger. Ben told me what had happened to him, um, and then the pieces began to come together because one of the people who had attacked Ben Santer was Fred Singer, and he was one of the people who was attacking me. The science around secondhand smoke hyped, the science around the ozone layer hyped going back 10, 15, 20 years. I'm happy to discuss all of these since I've been deeply involved in uh, these topics that you mention. Let me start with secondhand smoke. When I was in graduate school, I worked on stratospheric ozone depletion. And Fred would call me when I was in grad school and talk to me about how he didn't think humans were depleting ozone. And before that, he had real questions about whether humans were causing acid rain. He really criticized the work that connected secondhand smoke to, uh, to health impacts. And now he doesn't think global warming is an issue. So in 1995, you characterize secondhand smoke as a myth. We, you guys put out a press release on environmental myths uh, in 1995. Documents in the tobacco legacy library they got from, from all of the lawsuits over the tobacco companies, where a lot of this stuff has come out. And they say in there that they're extremely happy with your performance on this. This is from Brown and Williamson, and how they were arranging for media interviews for you, and you're doing uh, and so you did a big media, when you released this press release about Ms. you did this big media study. Uh, what are your views today on secondhand smoke? Do you think secondhand smoke is a carcinogen? How would I know? I'm no expert on, on cancer, and I don't know what's in secondhand smoke. I'm not a chemical toxicologist. Because I remember that day, um, I called Eric on the phone and I said, Eric, we need to write a book. Um, actually, I spoke to someone who was the Winston man uh, and he said when he was on the set he asked them uh, he asked the tobacco executives do you guys smoke and they said no that's for poor people that's for stupid people that's for black people we don't touch the stuff listen they did that was a difficult job to know they had a product that caused cancer and was addictive and to be able to keep selling it and to keep the question alive whether this is bad for you. That's not an easy job, but that is the playbook. And they develop a playbook saying doubt is our product. Just create doubt, keep going. Um, and at the same time, you know, this small group of people, when the tobacco money dried up, they went to new products. And today the big payday is energy. They sell doubt. And guys, the easiest thing to sell is doubt. <laughs> I mean, you could say to anybody, are you certain about that? Well, no, I'm pretty, well, I'm not, well, well. Selling doubt's easy, guys. Learning the truth is hard. Learning is difficult. And that's why we surround ourselves with the question marks. And what do we always say? We always, on the show, you know, 
whenever it comes to, to science and understanding science, whenever you hear something, what's the one thing you always want to say? Where are you getting your information from? Be specific and name your sources. All right, now guys, on the next clip, I'm getting an echo, I don't know why. But anyway, on the next clip, we're gonna show you, uh, we're gonna show you NASA. And Ted Cruz is running a meeting for funding NASA. And we want you to hear what the head of NASA has to say as far as getting data is concerned. Remember, data is the key word here. So Judy, hit it. You asked me about your chart. There's a lot of chartsmanship. I'm not sure what you include in exploration, for example. So <coughs> by my statements, I was not acknowledging that I agree with the numbers on the chart. So I, I don't want anyone to, to say I accept the numbers on the chart, because when you talk about exploration, a lot of times people don't count the launch complex. Uh, you can't go anywhere if you don't have a place from which to launch. A lot of times people don't count commercial crew and cargo. We can't go anywhere if we don't have a, a, a robust, sustainable low Earth orbit infrastructure. So there are a lot of things that people don't count. We can't go anywhere if the Kennedy Space Center goes underwater and we don't know it. And that's, that's understanding our environment. So as Senator Nelson said, it is absolutely critical that we understand Earth's environment because this is the only place that we have to live. Having had an opportunity to view it from a place where I look around, I'm not sure anybody else in here has had that opportunity. Uh, we've got to take care of it. And the only way we can take care of it is if, that we know what's happening. And the only way we know what's happening is to use instruments that we develop in NASA. And, and we do it better than anybody else. I'm proud to say that. I, I always come and brag on my, on my workforce. We do it better than anybody else in the world. And that allows us to get data to you and members of the Congress and the administration who make decisions. Uh, you know, we don't make decisions. We don't give you opinions. We give you data. And so I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done. And I'll go back and, you know, take it for the record to, to see whether we agree with the numbers on the chart, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. We now recognize uh, Senator Nelson for his question. Guys, you heard what the head of NASA had to say. We don't offer opinions, we offer data. Guys, this thermometer doesn't have an R or a D on it. It's not liberal, it's not conservative, it's got no ideology. What's all it does is give us data. That's it. And nobody does it better than NASA. And guys, th you know, think about when you're using your cell phone and when you're using the GPS on your cell phone and the girl comes on and says, make a left at Smith Street, you ever tell, you, you notice that she always tells you before you get to the street? Why? Because they know what they're doing. They got their act together. Could you imagine if <laughs> NASA told, oh, you were supposed to turn left two blocks back? No. Now the next clip we're going to show you is how they get their data. And when you see what these guys go through, you're going to say, wow, they're not guessing at nothing. This is all certified and correct, and you can't argue with it. Data is data. It doesn't know where it came from. It's just facts. So Judy, let's show how data is collected. Hit it. We've got a new report, and it's from NASA, and it says Antarctic ice, it's melting, and that melting process seems to be irreversible. Hmm. Now you say NASA's wrong, but you're not a scientist, are you? You're not, you're not going to make any claims like that. The interesting thing is the southern hemisphere, Antarctica as a whole, sea ice is well above average, breaking all sorts of records. Antarctic sea ice, which has hit the record all time ever recorded since satellite monitoring began. Global sea ice is at record ice extent since satellite monitoring began in 1979. So take a step back and look at the big picture. So that's exactly what we did. In order to see if their latest talking point is true, we took a step back to get the bigger picture of what exactly is happening in Antarctica. So we headed down to the bottom of South America to meet up with renowned glaciologist, Dr. Eric Rigneault. Dr. Rigneault is the lead author of the groundbreaking scientific paper, 
which has concluded that sections of the West Antarctic ice sheet are actually experiencing rapid melt. We caught up with him while he was observing glacial movements in Patagonia. We're here with Dr. Eric Rignon, and uh, maybe you could tell us exactly where we are. Uh, we are in the Marinelli Glacier on the southern tip of South America. Beyond that is the Antarctic Peninsula. And so what's happening to this glacier? This glacier is retreating extremely fast, and this is not part of the natural cycle. In the last 10, 20 years, they retreated more than the past century and even more. Uh, it's like changing the limit uh, on the freeway right. from 55 miles an hour to 550 miles an hour. <laughs> okay. Just calved right there. These changes are staggering. We actually don't have any idea how fast some of these systems can react to climate warming. What the past 20 years of data are showing us, it's they are reacting fast. And so is this kind of a precursor of what's happening in Antarctica itself? This is a precursor of what's going to happen in the peninsula, in yeah. the Antarctic Peninsula, and in Pine Island and Twaits. We're in for some real trouble with big time sea level rise. Now when Dr. Rignot refers to Pine Island and Twaits, He's referring to glaciers that form part of the western border of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And the reason he's so concerned about the melting is that together, these two glaciers are nearly the size of Germany. Now what's mind-blowing about Antarctica is just the sheer scale of it. It's gigantic. In fact, it's one and a half times the landmass of the entire continental United States. Now because these ice sheets are so massive, one of the best ways to study the changes that they are undergoing is from the air. So Dr. Rignot invited us to the NASA flight station in Chile, where they conduct the largest airborne polar ice survey in the world. So we're here in Punta Arenas, which is otherwise known as Tierra del Fuego, El Fen del Mundo, the end of the world. And right here, there's the NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, which measures the ice, which we're going to be going on a 12-hour flight going out over Antarctica. And we've just got clearance to fly. So we're going to go see what's happening to the ice in Antarctica. This is Operation Ice Bridge, a refitted DC-8 aircraft that functions as a flying scientific laboratory that tracks changes to Antarctica's ice. Dr. Michael Studinger, the project scientist, showed me some of the key technologies outfitted on the plane. This is an instrument that's called the Airborne Topographic Mapper, and it's a uh, laser altimeter. This is actually an incredibly awesome instrument to determine if the ice surface has changed just by five centimeters or not. And is so, it changing? It is changing rapidly. We see it changing uh, several meters per year over areas like Pine Island Glacier. That's a lot of ice. A lot of ice, yes. So today, we're going to fly out over Antarctica. Yeah. We're going to use the lasers and all the other instruments to just get data. Uh, every day exactly. you're going out getting yeah. data. All right, guys, if you could listen up. Looks like we've got a good mission for today, and we can go through the uh, manifest. Fuller. Here. Cochran. Here. Rigno. Yes. Tinto. Here. Shane Smith. Here. There will be some winds on the route, which is probably going to cause there to be some turbulence. You know, we're going to play the big boy program where if it's feeling bumpy, make sure you're restraining yourself. Also, I uh, do have uh, survival gear aboard the aircraft. Hopefully, we won't need to break it out. TCAT system, test OK. changes in Antarctica. This is the uh, mission director console. So the two mission directors are linked between the cockpit and the scientists in the back. So they control all the power. Uh, they communicate with the uh, pilots in the cockpit. This is running all the different stuff. Exactly, yeah. So we left southern Chile. Yeah. Tierra del Fuego, I touched it, sorry. And then we're going down over 
Antarctica here yep. to measure the ice and snow. That's right, weather permitting, we fly very low at 1500 feet above the surface, so we need clear conditions both for the optical instruments and also for aircraft safety. Through the command center, they're able to coordinate the pilot's speed and altitude along with the flight path to the instruments collecting the data from below. Like this one-of-a-kind radar that can actually see under the ice. So this is a uh, ice penetrating radar system. Wow. And that is uh, very important because different shapes and different depths determine what the, uh, the melting rates are. And this is the uh, most sophisticated instrument worldwide. This is the most state-of-the-art machine in the world to actually see what's happening under the ice. Now to record all this data as accurately as possible, the plane flies a fixed set of precise computer controlled flight paths. And today, we're flying the Pine Island Survey. And when we lower it down to 1500 feet, which is quite low, you get a good sense of the vastness of Antarctica and just how much water is captured in the ice here. Antarctica proper, I headed down into the belly of the plane, where the bottom-mounted instruments measured the ice below. So where are we right now? We're in the uh, forward cargo pit of the DC-8, and we're not going to fall out. Uh, no. I'm very confident we will not fall out. Okay, good. I weigh a lot more than you do, though, so I'm not as confident. It's pretty, pretty thick plexiglass. So. Okay. How many shots are you doing as we fly? Each system has a laser that fires 3,000 laser shots per second. 3,000 laser shots per second, so it's pretty accurate. Uh, it's extremely accurate, specifically for ice mapping. Wow. Do you know why we're mapping ice? Yeah, we're looking for changes um, year to year. We have mines that we have flown since 1992, basically, and that gives us a very long time series of how that ice is changing throughout those decades. And how is it changing? And uh, It's retreating quite rapidly. Uh, it's losing a lot of surface elevation as well. Best way to express the data? Charts, charts, charts. And guys, if you look at this, I mean, this is the famous hockey stick chart. And you could see where we are now. I mean, we busted out. And look at, look at where we are and look at where we busted out. The charts don't lie. Thermometers always tell the truth. Satellites can't lie. They haven't been programmed to do it. Sorry. Guys, facts are facts. You're just gonna have to learn to accept them. Sorry again. Now, earlier, we told you we were gonna show you how the Antarctic ice sheet, how they're twisting the figures and changing everything, and now we're gonna show you the truth. So this is it, watch how this works, and in this way when somebody says something, you'll be able to give them the old bada bang. So Judy, hit it. Now it was at this point I began to wonder, if it's so clear that the ice is melting in Antarctica, why does the new climate denier script focus on Antarctica actually having more ice? What do you say to the people who point to Antarctica and say, actually there's more ice in Antarctica than ever before? There's a little bit of confusion between the land ice and the sea ice. Right. They're totally different entities. The expansion of the sea ice in the Antarctic is related to the wind regime, which tends to expand the sea ice cover. The sea ice fools people because they think if the sea ice cover is extending, maybe it's getting cooler than Right, right. It's melting. Yeah. Well, it doesn't work that way. So as it turns out, the same intensified westerly winds contributing to the melt of glaciers in the west of the continent are likely blowing and increasing the surface ice in eastern Antarctica. However, since it's seasonal, it's just the same water freezing and then melting again, just like a lake in wintertime, and therefore has no impact on sea level rise. Here you're looking at an ice cube melting in your glass of water. And the land ice is additional ice cubes you're gonna pour into your glass of water. It overflows. The sea ice, remember, is a meter thick. A meter thick. The land ice is kilometers. The land ice is kilometers thick. Okay. 
how do we stop Antarctica from melting, or at least the West Antarctica ice shelf? I think uh, reducing our carbon emission is wishful thinking at this point. So stopping emissions isn't even enough, because we're going too fast. We're going too fast right now. This part of West Antarctica is going to fall apart no matter what. How much sea level rise is contained in the ice? So Pine Island, Twaits and its neighbors contain about one meter global sea level rise. If that whole sector goes down to sea, uh, it will entrain the retreat of the rest of West Antarctica. And uh, we're talking about three to five meters sea level rise. So one meter would be a, a global catastrophic event, but three meters would be, would re, remap the world as we know it. Yes, absolutely. This is a holy shit moment. That's not holy shit, it's worse than that. It's worse than holy shit. We're not ready for this. Okay, we got to make this quick, guys, because we want to get the last clip in which shows you what's going to happen when all the ice caps melt. But if a climate denier says to you, if they give you a snippy answer and say, well, what about Antarctica? What's going on? The ice is expanding in Antarctica. What do you do? You look them right in the eye and you say to them, are you talking about the land ice or the sea ice? Could you be specific and name the sources for your inquiry? Guys, you shut them. You'll never hear from them again. Because what'll happen is they'll go to look it up. They'll find out they were wrong. They won't be deniers anymore. They'll be believers. The last clip is what happens when all the ice melts and the people that live in Florida ain't gonna like this one. So Judy, hit it. Your yeah. viewers, by the way, there's a fantastic film coming out in about a week called Merchants of Doubt that is the best Judy, wrong clip, wrong clip, Judy. Naomi Oreski's book by we the We wanna go to 13. There we go. Um, let's, I got 7.56. This is a two minute, 2.44. Uh, let's push this as far as we can. 